life is suffering, but the posture that you take when facing these tragedies in life will either create heaven in your life or hell in your life. I think that it's very hard to pursue justice and then you becoming the, the monster or becoming that which you want to eradicate. So you're saying like nobody is, is objective. We don't think with our biases, we think through them. Yeah, I remember when Elon Musk mentioned, I can't remember which podcast, but he said something along the lines of free speech only works when you let someone say something you disagree with. In my opinion, it's even better if you can make money by not even thinking about money because if you're able to work remotely, oh. what an opportunity to be able to move to somewhere like this. Like you can live very good life. What I'm trying to say is that there are always creative ways you can make a space to save, to invest and, and, and things like that and then pursue what's meaningful to you. And my instinct is this is just the beginning. People should look into this and I'm sure there's other yes. towns in Spain and other oh, parts of Southern Europe. Entrepreneurs will thrive here. Very, yeah. Spend very little, have a great lifestyle and be, be able to focus in their businesses. All right, Carlos, how are you, man? It's good to be here in Spain with you today. Uh, why don't we just uh, have, uh, well, why don't we start off by saying, how, how are you doing? How's, how's everything been with you lately? How are you? Good, good. It's, lately has been uh, pretty hectic. So I just came from Nigeria. I was uh, I was part of a conference there for you know uh, it was like a Christian type of conference, but it's more people who are teachers, leaders in general. And right now I'm in the last phase of um, finishing my PhD thesis. So it's so good, but pretty busy. <laughs> so why why is it that you're doing? Uh... Well, first of all, what are you studying your PhD thesis in? So I'm doing a, a PhD uh, on philosophy. Uh, more specifically, it would be uh, an interdisciplinary approach between philosophy and theology, right? So what I'm trying to analyze is, um, so to speak, the relationship between secularism and faith in the West, uh, for the most part, I would say. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting topic that I think is becoming more important over time in the modern um, discourse. Right. 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 So we'll delve into that for sure uh, a little bit later on in the conversation. Sure. Uh, before we get into that, though, why don't we go through real quick? Um, well, first of all, you know, I'll just share with whoever's watching that. I've known you now for over 10 years. We met when I was in Spain on exchange program in undergraduate, and I, I, we hung out many times. We had a lot of, we've grown a lot since then. We were still, this, we're still kind of the same, but also grown a lot and matured <laughs> um, now that we're in our 30s. But anyhow, what I want to get into on this episode is I think you've lived a very interesting decade since now that we've come back together. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Spain while I've been traveling and you've made choices about how you've lived your life that might be unconventional to what normal people or society would expect perhaps. So I'll give you an example. So, you know, the fact you're doing your PhD in this very specific area um, and, the, and the kind of career path that you're trying to achieve here right. with, with that. And so why don't we go into, since I saw you when, when we were both kind of in college, <laughs> yes. what has happened since that point for you to go into this direction? Oh, wow. That's a long journey. I think, um, so for me, I would say that any intellectual question for me has, uh, has been the result of uh, emotional pain. You know, okay. I always tell people that I philosophize always from from pain, but pain is not always something negative. You know, sometimes we, we don't like to feel pain, but at times pain communicates that there is something to explore there. You know, there is a, something unknown that you need to pay attention to in the in the pursuit of truth or something like that. And so for me, I started studying a bachelor's degree in English studies, which basically in Spain, that means that I was studying English linguistics and literature. Then when I was in literature, I 
found I, I felt drawn to the humanities and the reflections and the study of human nature and the expression across different cultures in different times in history. But I felt specifically, uh, what would you say, uh, captivated by philosophical essays. And so the first uh, philosophical essay I was introduced to was my, my second year in, in my bachelor's degree. Uh, and I read Running After One's Hat, which is a short essay written by G.K. Chesterton. And, and English heart? After One's Heart? Right, no, hat, like a sombrero, okay. like a hat. So he was an English writer uh, from the Victorian times, and he was uh, famous, or people would call him the apostle of the common sense. And so G.K. Chesterton was really good at just paying attention to an ordinary reality, a daily reality, and then he will go really deep into uh, how that is a source of meaning without us realizing, you know? And so he did that. Uh, in many ways and so I realized oh wow actually I want to switch degrees and so back then my older brother Gabo he was doing a double major of uh, law and philosophy and I would skip my modernist modernist poetry class to go to philosophical anthropology and that is when wow hmm. that was, I was I was like I'm studying the wrong thing and this was in Madrid this was in, in, yes, in Madrid, Universidad Complutense de Madrid, one of the oldest and most famous universities in Spain. And I just felt completely drawn by philosophical anthropology. I felt drawn by the classroom, the type of questions they were asking, because I was the typical annoying student in the English classes, because mm. people like reading novels and asking some questions, but I just was really genuine in the pursuit of truth. And so I came across as really annoying. And fair enough, I, yeah. uh, you know... I talk too much, I can interrupt often, and, and I can be too hyper-focused without being considerate of other people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a genuine pursuit. Like, I really wanted to know, and some people didn't understand why I care so much, so to speak. And so that's why I, was, I felt, like, pretty out of place in my English degree, and then I wanted to pursue philosophy. But I also uh, wasn't naive enough because I wanted to get married. I'm a Christian, so back then I was 20... I was starting uh, my degree, I was, what, uh, 18, something like that. And I believe in marriage. Back then, I still believe in marriage. And so for me, it was really important to, you know, make some money to be able to marry uh, a sister in Christ, according to how I understand that, you know, and my beliefs. And so, and so yeah, so that's why I, in the end, finished the degree, English studies. Then I worked as an English teacher, and then I tried to find a way to still pursue my interest in philosophy. And so that's when uh, I talked to my wife, then I end up, ended up getting married with my wife, Sandra. And then uh, she was she was crazy because she has always support, supported me, I would say, like she has always supported me in my crazy adventures, uh, you know? It's not that she said yes immediately because we needed to discuss financial situation and all of that, but in the end, I was able to pursue my master's degree in philosophy, so history of philosophy and contemporary thought uh, part-time. So it took me two years to complete that while I was working. Uh, the first year, especially, I was working as a as an English teacher. And so, so yeah, and then... And then I was trying to save money. I moved with my parents, uh, even though we both were kind of working just to save enough money to be able to apply to a U.S. university, get a scholarship to do a Ph.D. in philosophy. But then, you know, for some mystical reason, the providence of God, then I was offered the opportunity to get my living expenses covered and get a, a, the tuition paid for uh, to pursue a Ph.D. in philosophy here full time. So three years in Spain. It's not six years. Six years is in the U.S. Here it's three years. And I'm about to finish. So in November, late November, I need to hand in my final draft, the, the, the official written version, which it will be about 350 pages. And then wow. I have to wait two or three months. And then I will defend that orally in front of five professors. And there is cross-examination. And if everything goes well, then I will become Dr. Carlos Santos. But, you know, just please call me Carlos. I feel weird about the titles. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little bit like, just yeah. long story short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and to be 
to be clear for those that don't know that are viewing, so you originally come from Peru, mm -hmm. right? And then you came to Spain when you were in your teens, was it? Or? Right. I, I, yeah. I was born in Lima. I, well, to be more specific, Callao, Peru, which is close to Lima, is the coast. And I grew up in one of the most uh, dangerous neighborhoods in, in the city of of Peru, like in inside of Lima or different cities, mm -hmm. Callao was one of the most dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So the police doesn't go there. There are drug dealers everywhere. And so I remember as a kid, my dad would not let me to cross this our street. Like I had to go with my bike within the same street because there were gangs and guns and things like that. So it was pretty wow. rough. Even though in the end we ended up moving to a wealthier neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, once my mom, my mom emigrated to Spain and then eventually she brought us here when I was 11 years old. So I'm 30 now, so it's been a while since I wow. moved. Yeah. Yep. Wow, that's incredible. So yeah, you, you came from a maybe a tougher background. Oh yeah, that's yeah, for sure. Your family had to really struggle and, and push to get to Spain and to have a better uh, better life, right? Yeah, yeah. My, my mom is a tough, tough cookie, man. It's a tough woman, so... Whenever I feel like complaining, I try to remember what she did. And for me, the concept of self-made self -made man, it never even appeals to me, even though I, I'm very hardworking and I, you know, I just go for things against the odds to see what happens because I already have the no, so let me see if I can get the yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's kind of my mentality. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like, man, like... You know, she, she, I want to honor her sacrifice. And so for me, it's just not just about money and things like that. It's just to honor uh, her past, her sacrifice and all of that. So I would say that, yeah, there were many sacrifices made, that's for sure. And, and I feel like it took, yeah, it took a lot of courage. I mean, my mom started work cleaning bathrooms in different cafeterias. And then mm. she became, she started working in just as a waitress. Mm -hmm. And and then she little by little like tried to you know like uh, find different opportunities and things like that and then that's how we started studying and I think that I was the first person who graduated from a bachelor's degree in my entire family wow. if, of so many generations uh, as far as I can tell so I was probably the first person who graduated from university in my entire family. That's crazy, and then also now masters. Oh, that's unprecedented. I pro I'm PhD. probably the only person in my entire lineage that has a PhD. Probably. Wow. Like, yeah. That's as incredible. far as my my grandparents told me about their parents and things, yeah. like I'm the I'm the first person I would say. Do you feel like even when you were young, like in Peru, and then when you came as an immigrant to Spain, first of all. I want to ask you, how, how was that coming from Peru? Like, did you feel like you didn't fit in with the local Spaniards? Was that difficult? Um, and I know your mom was also working very hard. To How, how was that? Yeah, um, we came, uh, yes, so the transition was weird. We, re we were really close to my mom mm. back then. Uh, what were, we are still really close to my mom, not, not so much to other family members. Uh, and so we're three brothers. So my brother, my oldest brother is Roberto. Uh, so I'm 30, he's 37, I believe. And my, then my brother Gabriel is uh, 31 and I'm 30. And so I came with my brother Gabriel. So we came at the same time. Roberto was already living in Madrid and with my mom in the same apartment. So we were in the south of, of Madrid uh, living together. And yeah, I remember going to school was really weird because uh, my accent was different. Uh, yeah. I didn't know some of the expressions. Uh, I didn't have a young family member who introduced me to people of my age. So it was Gabriel. Just quickly for the audience yes. too, can you, can you try to um, show the difference? I don't think people in the English speaking world realize how different the Spanish accent is to like a Latino accent. Can you sh can you try or no? Uh, yeah, I mean, know, what do you want me to phrase, say? Like a phrase, I don't know. Like... Ah, but for example, mañana voy a ir a estudiar a la biblioteca, luego coger el bus y luego, eh, pues a lo mejor voy a encontrarme con un colega. Was, what so, accent was that? was that? That was from here. Well, okay. my accent is funny because it's mixed. Yeah. But a Peruvian would say, oh, you're, you, you lost your Peruvian accent. Uh, yeah. But... But a Spaniard would say, you still have a weird accent, so, okay, so okay. you never fit in. Yeah. Uh, so that's part of the, of the thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah. anyways, uh, but yeah, people do know, like people realize. Uh, yeah, anyways, so it's tough yeah. to, because I don't even know how to emulate the Spanish accent. Yeah. 
So it's a very strong accent. Yeah, yeah. I've spent a lot of time in both Latin America and right. mainly and then Spain and right. even when I come here I'm fluent in Spanish, but then sometimes I'm listening to the really strong Spaniards <laughs> Spaniards. That's it's very right. different and I'm assuming yeah. there's probably a class element. Oh, that's too oh, bad, yes. right? Like if you're someone coming from another country, yes. even though you speak the same language, they kind of maybe look at you as a foreigner or right they would call me yeah they would insult me uh, in the street they would insult me at times panchito that's the that's the insult here panchito or guachupino so that is a pejorative way of of calling latinos you know mm. and so that was definitely the case and i remember getting into fights over it you know yeah. i remember one day somebody insulted me and i was a travel kid to some degree so mm. i i started boxing back then so you know yeah, I just, you're a big guy yeah, so I do. I threw a chair to the guy. So I got it. Anyways, don't do that. At yeah, home. Yeah. Like, don't do that. I don't endorse that, of of course. But back then, I you know, it was survival. Like yeah. you were just. Um, then my older brother did, did help us kind of integrate better with some groups, but it took a while to just. Um, I feel like my life was like in a veil for a long time. I feel like honestly, before my conversion at fifteen into Christianity on my own like conscious of what i was doing i feel like before that it was like a veil of strong emotions reacting to things but i would say that yeah i mean people wasn't that used to uh and you know let's not even speak of black people i remember that i could only see one black person in my neighborhood back then so latinos mm. were more common but i would say that yeah there was there was for sure this discrimination to some degree of course in classes and things like that um so yeah anyways that that's i would say that that mm. was part of it that's for sure yeah that's that's in incredible mm. so anyways i i think i interrupted you at one point you were mentioning some of the uh what were you saying you were talking about some stories about um i think your studies and just kind of <clears throat> growing up here in spain you'd also talked about you got married um and then you were you were teaching english yes. while doing your master's and then what, what happened then? Then you got sponsored, you said, to... What, what are you doing now, or what have you been doing the last three years? Okay, so, yes. So, for context, right? So, I was working as an English... After my bachelor's degree, I got married right away with my wife. I was 23 years old. We wow. were broke. We were living in Puente de Vallecas in Madrid, which is one of the... You know, people say, be careful there. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm like, wow, bro, this is nothing compared to Callao, Peru. You know yeah. what I mean? But, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, for, for people, it just as a reference, it wasn't yeah. like a super nice neighborhood. Like, mm -hmm. it, it was tough at times, you know? And so we went, we were living in this place for 500 euros a month. We couldn't afford more. I was making back then 1,100 euros, and my wife was making 350 euros together. Wow. Yeah, that's tight. That's, that's tight. We didn't have money really for much, yeah. so we were, you know. Uh, so that's how we started. And then eventually I, uh, she changed jobs, and then I got into this master's degree. Um, and then once I was doing that, uh, that is when things changed. So... I was doing sales for a while, so I finished my master's degree because I was the first year of my master's degree. I was working as a part-time English teacher and as a student part-time, right? And then the second year, I completely uh, quit my job because the pandemic started. That's mm -hmm. when the pandemic started. We moved with my with my at my parents' house, uh, and then that's when Sandra was still commuting to work uh, in Madrid. So uh, one hour, because she we moved to Toledo, like mm -hmm. to a village, so it was yeah. far. And I was studying at home, like in my mom's house, and like full time. Like I was trying to just get the master right, finish it. And then right after that, I got a, a sales job for an American company remote. So I started doing sales and making more money. And in that transition, uh, that's when uh, it took like a year ish or two years doing that sales job that we were trying to figure out how how I could pursue a PhD um, uh, how could I how I could pursue a PhD level studies in philosophy right or find a way of monetizing that becoming a professor or something like that and that is when you know there was a teacher in, in a professor a, a chemist uh, a yeah, prof professor from the States, John Ox, like he, he's also known. Uh, and he said, apply here. And so mm. there was this private committee uh, that were funding people who wanted to pursue higher education. And so I apply. And 
that's when I got the interview. So the first interview, they really liked my profile and all of that. There were like four different interviews and throughout all of this time, I was doing a full-time job sales, you know, like from three or from two, from, no, from 1 p.m. to nine or something like that p.m. That was my schedule uh, because the U.S. Uh, time and, and all of that. So I was trying to do all of that and then eventually I was given the opportunity to pursue this PhD and then I basically applied to the Universidad Pontificia Comillas in Madrid. It's a private university, but it's a really, really good university for philosophy and theology. The, mm. This is a Jesuit university. Ah. The Jesuits have been the best at preserving the philosophical and theological tradition. So, so it's a really great place to study. Uh, and so I applied there. I applied there. So it's one of the top of the country for this type of field. And I applied there. And I got accepted. And so the, the, the committee that I was interviewed with me as a possible candidate to support, they in the end says, yes, we choose you. They only chose six people out of many that apply. And so in the, in the end, I, I was given the to full-time scholarship for my living expenses. And that's when I quit it. I quit mm. my job as a sales guy, even though I was making good money. So that was scary because there wasn't any guarantee that after this three year process, I was going to get any job. In yeah. fact, in fact, the likelihood is that you will not get employed. And I just didn't want to be an, a secondary philosophy teacher yeah. because I don't like that, that, that level of education. I think because I feel like when you are You're talking about high school, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have, I have experience because as an English teacher, I was also teaching in a high school for a while. Yeah. So, but you have to be almost like a babysitter and a teacher at the same time. And yeah. I just wasn't interested in that. The level of, of discourse. Oh of yeah. Videos. Yeah. I wanted to teach adults and complicated yeah. stuff and, yeah. and nothing wrong. We need all level, all levels of education. And yeah. you know, I wouldn't be here without my primary and secondary school teachers, you know, and I was a troublemaker. So imagine, yeah. so I'm so extremely grateful for teachers in general. Of course, it was just, it, it wasn't just the thing that drew me, like, you know, like it wasn't the thing that, that I was called for. That's how I felt it. And so that's why in the end I was like really trying to pursue, okay, let me find a way to either monetize this or work for a university or find a way to do what I love, you know? But at the same time, I, I was always aware of the financial issue that monetizing philosophy is extremely hard. That's why I yeah. tell people, listen, do not get into debt to pursue philos a philosophy degree or gender mm -hmm. studies or things like that. Like, don't. Like, if mm -hmm. you, if you, like, don't because it's a waste of, it's, it's going to be a bad decision financially so you need to find a creative way of pursuing that while not going broke personally that's how i think uh, that's how i view it and so in the end i got this opportunity uh it's been almost a little bit past three years uh so i'm about to finish mm -hmm. and i i already received a contract so i started working full time as a well, this will be the equivalent for people who don't know like the context of the church i go to nathan knows better uh, I would be like a teacher, not a pastor, so a teacher uh, for the Western European churches. Almost like a scholar. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I go to these specific academic conferences or a specific events where it's very specialized, the type of teaching I give. Yeah. So I negotiated my contract with the, this committee that hired me in mm -hmm. Europe as a professor. This is what I told them. I'm going to negotiate this contract as, a, as if I were a professor because that's the level I'm trying to hit. Like mm -hmm. I, that's the that's the level of excellence and, and rigor that I want to, um, what would you say, embody as a as a educator in general, and so yeah, so I'm about to be a Dr. Carlos Santos as I said before, but I got a contract before, so now I'm already traveling, you know, to different countries to teach. I'm about to travel to Estonia to teaching a conference and also then to Italy to teach again to other people. So it's 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 very specialized uh, in that sense. Uh, but I still like to teach, you know, regular members because I enjoy being in the trenches with people grounded, uh, you know. And so, but that's pretty much it. So I had two different options. I either, I either was, uh, could pursue like the academic route, just full time, a philosophy professor, move anywhere just to, you know, get some experience and, and then little by little, uh, you know, find better positions. Or I could I, I could have just be work for a private religious humanity institution, which that would be called like the equivalent. It's, mm -hmm. It would be like a private 
educational institution for religious studies, for faith and things like that in that context, uh, even though I don't only speak in those in those circles, I also speak uh, in conferences, uh, philosophy conferences and things like that when, when I apply or present a paper and things like that. So it's very like a hybrid. I always, it's funny because I was hired as a teacher, uh, but I don't have a PhD in theology. So that that is that is another controversial thing because I, a lot of people when they hear the word philosophy they don't know what to make of it. Yeah. Right. And in in the context of churches, a lot of people associate rationality uh, with trying to replace faith or in opposition of faith. Even Martin Luther would say like uh, the reason the prostitute. Like, like Martin, uh, la, la, la razón la prostituta, like mm. meaning like reason was like a whole, like oops, that that's, that would be a strong word, but basically a prostitute, right? Like reason goes with anything, and mm. it's not like faith that is goes to God. But I I completely disagree with Luther, even though uh, I do agree in other aspects. So he mm -hmm. was a definitely a tormented soul as well. But yeah, right. Um, you know, I'm really interested also to understand. Where did you get this interest in thinking, deep thinking, philosophy that you were, even though married and starting a family, yes. that you just continued to push through and get this higher education and that you're still so passionate about these topics? Um, yeah, is this something that you felt even when you were in your childhood, teens, or is it something that's developed over time? That's interesting. I think that for the longest time, I didn't feel like I was... Uh, I didn't like studying at all before okay. I was going to drop out from high school to wow. working a mechanic with a auto body, like uh, preparing the, the exterior part of the of the car. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what my oldest brother was doing. And so I didn't have any academic aspiration. I was a terrible student as a student. Um, I didn't have really good grades. And so actually, like I always thought that I had a really low IQ. Mm. Then later I discovered that I had ADHD. I was diagnosed as an adult. I went to a, a specialized center because a friend of mine told me to go like, hey, you're checking all the boxes and things like that. And then the psychologists and the psychiatrists that saw me, they told me, no, no, you, you don't. It's not that you you don't really have low IQ, because if you did, you wouldn't you wouldn't have gone this far with ADHD. There's no way. Mm. Because ADHD is that doesn't have to do with uh, so much with intelligence per se or IQ. It has to do more with keeping attention. So I, I had a problem of focusing in things that I wasn't interested. That's why I was a really bad student mm. because I wasn't interested in the things they were teaching me. I was hyper focused on other things. But I would say that it was weird. I feel like honestly, the interest for thinking came after. Um, I would say a couple of years after my conversion to Christianity. So I was 15 and I remember my dad told me, just read the Bible, like Luke, or I don't remember which gospel. And I was like, what is this? And mm -hmm. I, I started reading. And then for me, it was more a moral, con a moral, spiritual concern of being right with the divine or with God um, at that point. And then that, I guess the honesty in the pursuit of what was highest led me to asking more difficult questions. And so I remember when I got baptized into my church, because I'm not Catholic, I grew up Catholic, but I go to a Christian church. I remember I was asking the leaders or the other brothers in the church uh, and sisters, I was like, oh, who created God? Where are the dinosaurs? Why, if, if God is good, why is there, so, why there is so much evil in the world and things like that? And they gave me like very simple answers and I was completely unsatisfying. I would remember I was having an existential crisis and crying so much and I, mm. and I was, I felt completely forsaken, uh, not by then at an emotional level, but forsaken intellectually. And, and sometimes we want to make this neat distinction between intellect and emotions, but I would say that they, it's combined. I mean, mm. when people philosophize, they philosophize with everything, with their bones, flesh, heart, like, the, you know, uh, the, the ideas that really, that you really believe, they, they move you in a profound manner. And so for me, it, it just, it pained me not to know. Like mm. it, it, it just caused me so much distress. I, I just wanted to know. And to some degree, what I discovered later is that I was trying to fix many emotional problems through intellectual certainty. 
So it's in a way, in a way, I was intellectualizing a lot of trauma and, and, and hurts that I had from the past. And so that is also an issue, but I still think that, I guess. That's a really deep point. Yeah, sorry. Actually. Yeah, no, yeah. No, I'm actually really Go curious ahead. because I actually don't know. I, yes. We should delve into that. Yes, yes, that yes. I think that's a deep point. Yeah. So you're saying that okay. you were relying on intellectual certainty. Yes. To cover over trauma. That is correct. What does that actually mean? Well, you know, I, I guess for me personally, it was that there were things, there were wounds, mm. I would say, in my psyche, in my soul, in my whole being, that I wanted to fix just by reading a book. Oh, I, I get it. I have this problem. And, and people thought I was really open with my life just because I would share any detail of my life. Mm -hmm. But I feel like one thing is for you to say, hey, this happened to me. Mm. And the other thing is letting yourself be in touch emotionally mm -hmm. with what you're saying. And I, I was really good at compartmentalizing what I was saying actively and what I was feeling. And I feel like what, when this got really revealed, like in a very strong way, was when I, I, I started dating my, the person who is now my wife. Uh, we were 20 i finished my degree i started working and so we started we got in, we dated and then got engaged and during this period like for some reason i felt completely abandoned when he was talking politely with a brother in a church or with a friend in the street like oh, common friends so when like, your wife your, your now wife when she would talk when to, we were dating when she would yeah. talk to somebody in a friendly way you yeah. know because my wife is not flirtatious at all and she's very polite way she she behaves very properly in in that sense so she doesn't lead people on or anything like that <laughs> not at all like not at all and so she's very exclusive uh mm -hmm. when it comes to how she when she shows her inner self yeah and so in that sense, she wasn't doing anything inappropriate. And I knew that intellectually. So I knew intellectually that she wasn't doing anything wrong. Like I knew, I knew intellectually, but I could not help but feel abandoned. Mm. So just because I knew it intellectually, I couldn't fix how I was feeling. Mm. Like it was body-based type of problem. And so, and that, that led me to therapy to to heal to to journal to do to imagine those situations in my childhood where i legit felt neglected or that i was neglected to some degree uh and then you know reimagine that those parts of my life but at, at an emotional level so that i cried so much it was a long painful process of like it was like this so like a and little little by little like and my wife couldn't even make a compliment compliment about anybody like, oh this actor is handsome like if she would say that i would cry for two weeks in my bed like it was rough like it was i was a mess and you know it, so was it jealousy was it fear of abandonment i would say i would say that that's the thing right like at times people can criticize uh, yeah. men who are jealous in a very shallow way oh this person is just misogynist or this this guy has a low view of women that's why he wants to be in control and not let her talk about with anybody no that is just a silly oversimplification because i wasn't defending this at a theoretical level i actually agree with my wife and with everybody else that it was wrong for me to feel this way because mm. the situation di didn't merit my reaction. Yeah. But I could not help but feel this way, even though I knew intellectually that wasn't the case. So, so that's that's why it's, it was a deeper wound. Jealousy was kind of like the surface, mm -hmm. you know. But it was wounds of acceptance and 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 just fear of feeling abandoned and forsaken and and so that that was for me my coping mechanism was to either flee from the pain through the use of, you know, uh, graphic images and things like that. I was in alcohol or smoking, so it was fleeing from the pain, numbing my emotions, anesthetizing the pain to be able to just cope with reality. But that wasn't healthy because that deprived you also from the potential of connection with another human being. So yes, you numb the pain, but you also numb the possibility for deeper joy and deeper love. So, so you cannot have, yeah, <laughs> so you pay a price. So don't, don't do that. Uh, and so that, that's why I needed to heal. And in the process of healing, I, I was able to experience a profound sense of acceptance and love uh, by her and by God and by everybody else. So, Do you think that a lot of people nowadays might 
feel that pain and they cover it over. They're not even aware of it. They cover it over with other things. Yeah, I think so. I think that there is, I think that society or has normalized esca escapism. I yeah. would say that either through social media, through the validation of others, through, you know, self-improvement. Like, I feel like, I feel like the tricky ways this becomes, this become even darker. I think is when the means are look really good. You know what I mean? Um, I think that we build narratives that would protect us from, from looking inside, right? So it's always the other person and just going to be in an individualistic way to, to, to not. For example, some people, when they are betrayed, some people do not get close enough to anybody because they are afraid of deeply loving somebody deeply to the point that they might feel a profound pain if something happens in the relationship. And so I feel like yep. then people cope and they say, for example, the red pill community is a perfect example of this. You know, they, they prescribe that men shouldn't cry in front of women because the mm. women would, res would lose respect for the men. But I'm like, bro, what kind of women are you dating that will respect? <laughs> <laughs> like it's a human emotion. Like, you know what I mean? And so there's this weird narrative. Well, what do you define as the red pill community? Because you mentioned that it seems like that's a trend. Oh, yes. I, uh, well, we could discuss masculinity because I think that this is closely related to addictions, to how we view trauma and things like that. There's this meta narrative about masculinity and the her hero journey okay. that, of course, I do believe in the hero journey, but I feel like it takes different forms and shapes. Mm -hmm. and I feel like the red pill community type of narrative is... So what is the red pill community? Okay, so let me for? define... Well, I guess according to eyes. everything I consume, and I consume a lot, okay? <laughs> uh, just as an anthropological analysis of the type of person who, who feels drawn to that. So I listen, so for, for the reference, I listen to probably more, more than 100 hours of fresh and fit podcasts. So it's a, okay. this, this is a, don't watch that. <laughs> How does your wife feel about it, that? Well, she knew I was going to do a, a podcast episode on Andrew Tate and the decline of masculinity, which you can watch on my podcast, Philosophy in Real Life, two episodes on that. And so I was trying to understand what was the appeal. Because okay. actually, it's funny. My wife one day asked me, do you know who Andrew Tate is? And I said, no. I said, oh, I'm happy that you don't know about him. I was like, oh, let me look into him because oh, I'm a very curious person. So your wife started it. Uh, so my wife triggered me, provoked me into <laughs> searching this. And I said, oh, I'm going to do a, an episode on this because everybody, then I realized how um, influential he is, was being among young men. And so I was like, huh, oh, this is really interesting. And, and when I was reading online that people, people are, men, young men are drawn to Andrew Tate just because of misogyny and things like that. I was like, that's too fast and too cheap. I, mm. I do not buy it. There has to be something else mm. because I know plenty of misogynistic men that n by no means they have the, the influence that Andrew Tate have had over people. So I was like, ah, that's too easy, too easy of an answer. So let me, let me listen to him, you know? And so I, I think I listened to Andrew Tate for, I don't know, probably more than 50, hundred hours of podcasts, conversations, reactions, and things like that. And so I was trying to just understand the, the Andrew Tay or the Red Pill community. And of, of course, I do not agree with them. Uh, although How would you summarize what it is? And then I, we can go into more I think detail. I think that they, they present uh, an ethic or a masculine ethic that is really based on the warrior ethic of ancient times. You know, mm. like Homer, Hesiod, I'm talking about 5th, 6th century before Christ. Okay. So in the Greeks. Uh, Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche actually was really fond of, of the warrior ethic as well, you know, and so they, so pe people, people don't deserve things just because they need to earn it. And, and the way you earn respect and, and is by the value you construct with your life. You know, you have to work hard, you have to train hard. And so there are many virtues such mm -hmm. as discipline, credit, perseverance that, you know, people sometimes oversimplify this and they say, oh, that's, that's stupid. That's dumb. It's like, bro. Like, have you ever tried to work out just three times a week for a year? Good yeah. luck. Like, it takes so much freaking discipline and determination to even make that happen. Mm, most people don't do it. Oh, most people, no, far from it. Yeah, the people do the opposite. And information alone is not enough because now by research, medical research and all of that, you know that, for example, running consistently, like, give you the same effects that many antidepressant medicine. 
Mm. For example, like, if, oh, you are taking an antidepressant uh, medicine. Well, running consistently will do the same thing for you. But instead of getting it exogenously, like from external from your body, your body will create this hormonally, for example. Mm. That's one of the latest research on that. What you eat, how you sleep, all of these things influence that. So what I'm trying to say is that, like, people sometimes name these things as superficial, but what, but... For example, Andrew Tate was a full-time world champion of kickboxing, right? So I did boxing for 10 years, from 11 years old to 21, pretty much. But I, little by little, I stopped practicing it, even though I really enjoy it. And I want to go, go back to just training as a discipline. Uh, but you know how much courage it takes to, to face your fears and get, go to the ring and mm. fight another person that is going to hit you really hard. Yeah. Like, if you just say that, oh, that's silly, that's superficial, you don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Mm. You, you just don't get it. You just don't get it. It takes so much. So much. You have to face so much within you to even do that. Now, having said that, obviously, it doesn't end there. That's the issue, right? It doesn't end there. There, there are more things, more virtues, more goods that you could embody in your life than just discipline or promiscuity and things like that those are kind of like the toxic manifestation of this like oh i'm so great that i'm going to do whatever i want to do because i'm a high value man with you so i would say that the the red bull community is okay so you build your value once you get you become a high value man and by this you have social capital so many meaning you know people you have influence you are wealthy you have worked really hard you look great so you have exercise and all of that now the thing is that a lot of women will want you. That's right. the thing. So now that a lot of women will want you or want you, want to be with you, then now you can dictate the rules of the relationship. Mm. And so they end up coming up with an open-ended relationship. So it's only it's only open on the guy's side. So the guy can't sleep with anybody because he's a high-value man. And if you want to be with me, oh, sorry, you have to deal with it. Mm. Right. And so and the, but then the women is close on the on the women end. So you have to be exclusive to me. Mm. I'm a guy. And since I'm high, high and if you don't like it, the door is there. Right. And wow. so and so so they they present this dichotomy. Right. Because I'm high value. Now I can determine all of this. And so even fresh and fed or Andrew Tate, they would say, like, just work hard. Don't focus on women, because once you get wealthy and you have all of these resources that like women will go to you mm -hmm. and you know, there's some truth to it. Like, but the, the point is, I disagree with the prescription. I do agree Just with the values. Just quickly on that too. So I, I, that's a really interesting point you raised about the kind of warrior ethic, which yes. has been an inspirational, I think. Oh, yes. Um, the, Stoic, the Stoics, people are obsessed, obsessed with the Stoics and it comes from that aspiration, this the warrior ethics. And we've kind of lost that as a society, I think, especially for men, quote unquote, who maybe they live in an, a city they work nine to five they don't That's work correct. out they don't feel like That's they correct. use their body or their strength or whatever and they just feel kind of uh, emasculated maybe yes yes that is and correct. also another thing too that you mentioned is that that ethic can lead to turning the tables in terms of the sexes yes because i think a lot of men now feel that women have a lot more power in the dating market where they the women are dictating how things work whether you agree with that or not, I'm not I'm saying I believe in that, but I think a lot of men feel neglected that they don't have much negotiating power or much uh, yes. attention from women. Right. And I think that's been shown through studies. And so I guess those people, would you say, find hope in this message of being able to become a high value man and to be able to dictate the terms? with women yeah absolutely i think well let's go back to even the appeal of andrew Tate's message so my conclusion was that that you know we come from okay so classic feminism which i would consider myself a feminist of the second wave not the last one i don't know <laughs> you know let's say that you know so i believe in equality of opportunities for men and women and i think that they are intrinsically valuable i don't necessarily think that it has to look the same way okay so that's basically my stance mm -hmm. so so I would say that feminism was really good in the sense that it really criticized, so to speak, the toxic masculinity. And, and by toxic masculinity, I mean the madman Donald Draper type of archetype, right? So I work, I'm a workaholic and when I'm, I'm at home, I'm absent. I just, I'm just there for birthdays or repairing the car and that's it. And then I have two, three lovers in different cities. So 
that's basically the archetype. So if you want to criticize that, fair enough, man. Like I do criticize that. I, I think that it was a good fair criticism towards that model of masculinity, right? This absent person disengaged from from their from their own emotions uh, absent fathers they would hit you really hard they would not connect with their children they would treat women as an as, just as an object you know as a means to an end that's mm. it so i do agree with that criticism i think that the problem is that the the contemporary message from you know most of the philosophical feminist schools uh, of thoughts i would say is just oh what what are men oh it's uh, we don't know it's whatever you feel or a potential rapist, uh, predators, uh, micro sexists, and all of that. And I feel like there is a place to all of that, but I feel like what are we left with? Okay, mm. so we shouldn't be the Donald Draper type of archetype. Fair enough. But what is a man? And then if I ask, it's like, oh, you're a potential rapist, you are all of these internalized sexists, and all of that. It's like, okay, another negative message Dest destroying the constructing masculinity. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. What is the positive message? What what am what am I supposed to be as a man? Mm. And then in that, so to speak, absence of answers and this surrounding negativity, necessary and fair to to some degree, but it's still the negation of what a man is. Then Andrew Tate comes and whoo, mm. he throws a message and saying. Do not apologize, you weak men. Start working out. Stop doing this. Start dating. Do not beg women. Do, do not be pathetic. And so that was a strong message and very unapologetic about his conclusions. And there was a huge appeal because if you're a guy and you're just and you're an addict, you, you feel weak, emasculated, and you just want something in your life. I, I would say that it's funny because Jordan P the Jordan Peterson phenomenon came first. Yes. You know, a lot of young men felt drawn. And I feel like that is... a uh, way more positive version of, of masculinity, meaning you can do something about it. You can carry this heavy rock and do something with your life, take responsibility for your own life, do something better. Uh, what is the one thing that if you stop doing your life will improve so much? And what is the thing that if you st st start doing or stop doing, you know, things will change for the first. So I think he was really good. I, I, I think that Peterson is a genius when it comes to moral and psychological philosophy. I think it's, it's the best you can listen to. Like in my estimation, and I know people will hate me for this. I do not care when it, because I have listened to Peterson thousands of hours. So I have analyzed yeah. also his thoughts. When it comes to moral philosophy, he's extremely good. When it comes to political philosophy, I, I just don't get it. I just don't see it. I, I completely disagree with Peterson when it comes to that. So, so, so why don't we summarize sorry, those, yes. those points in terms of, so what do you mean, what do you think that he gets right in terms of moral philosophy and what do you think he might be missing the mark on in terms of political philosophy? Yes. So in simple language. Yeah, in simple language, yeah. I would say that the, in moral philosophy, I would say that he, life is suffering. Okay. And for you to endure suffering in life without getting resentful, and creating hell in your life and be petty and resentful and just pathetic, you have to take responsibility for your life. You have to accept the challenges that are in front of you to make something better of your life. And in that sense- But what about this? What if I say it's not my fault? It's society's fault. I've been right, oppressed. Right. Uh, people have done me wrong. Um, I'm not able to grow economically because of a recession, because of all this stuff. There's so much complications. What, what's your response to that? Well, I would say that there is a different... I have rights. Yeah, yeah, fair. I have rights to happiness. I have rights. Do I or no? Well, that is a, a, a conceptual leap, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. I would, say, I would say there are tragedies in life. Yes. That's for sure. That is not your undoing. It's not your, own, it's not your fault. But the posture that you take when facing these tragedies in life will either create heaven in your life or hell in your life. Like mm. things can get a lot worse than mm. the tragedy itself. That's okay. what I'm trying to say. So for example, let's say that you, you were born without legs. Yeah. That's a tragedy because there yeah. are so many things that you won't be able to do like other regular human beings. Yeah. Now, you can, you can just accept that fact to do something with your life and say, okay, I don't have legs, but what do I have? Oh, I have arms. So yeah. let me let me do something with this. Let me find a way of exp same thing with people with sports, right? Like some people don't have legs and they are in better in better uh, shape than me. 
because yeah. they train their upper body. That's all they have. Yeah. And, and so what I'm trying to say is that you could always look at the uh, glass of water half full or half empty, right? So it's, it's perspective many times. So, so, but if you adopt a resentful attitude, like, oh, I don't have legs. My yeah, life I hate sucks. everyone that has legs, and everyone has legs, and I don't. And everybody has legs. And why did God do that? Like, why, why did God or the universe, uh, 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 you know, did do that to me? Oh, I'm ugly. Oh, I'm short. Oh, I don't have high IQ. Oh, I'm black. Oh, I'm Latino. Oh, I'm women. Oh, I'm... Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that you can find an unlimited number of things why you are oppressed or in disadvantage compared to other people. But I, I would say that even though that analysis at a macro level is quite useful to, what would you say, redeem the institutions and, and foster institutions that are less tyrannical and more benevolent. That is mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. That is true. But at a, at a personal level, dwelling so much on your tragedies, I don't think it's, it's, it's good. And, I, and I've, again, I've grown in one of the most poor neighborhoods in Peru, most dangerous. And I've seen two, the same brothers who were extremely poor. One, one when the route of criminality and drugs, same mother, same, same parents, same everything, socioeconomic, all of this. And they both make different choices. Hmm. And one was taking care of his mom. There were two brothers in the, in the same street. One was taking care of his mom, going to church. And he, he, would pro he probably died poor. Hmm. But his life, he created a little heaven hmm. in his life based on love and connection compared to the other person that was just criminality, drugs, and he ended up dying from overdose. Oh, wow. OD. Yeah, so, so, so that's what I'm trying to say. Things can get a lot worse. If you think that tragedy is bad, mm. resentment and bitterness is worse. I would wow. say so. Wow. Yes, <laughs> resentment. I mean, and so I feel like Andrew Peterson did that for a lot of people, like, like help people to, to envision a different path, aiming higher. I think, um, Andrew Tate did it to some degree. Like they created, they they preach a vision of the good life. That's a bit, but you know, people, a lot of people were nihilistic. They didn't have a clear telos, a clear purpose in life. And Peterson said, "Hey, search for what's meaningful. Hmm. Pursue that, and that will take you places. Aim higher. Hmm. God is that. God is there. You know, in this union archetypal way, like the highest for, the highest form of." good that you can envision in your life pursue that and that will take you to heaven wow something like that you know he uses this metaphorical language all the time but andrew Tate was like what is the vision of the good life oh women cars wealth social capital and being being able to fight although i would say to be fair uh to andrew Tate, he has he definitely has had a development in his character you know what mm. i mean but yeah, I would say that definitely Peterson in his moral philosophy is a lot more nuanced, a way deeper than the credit he gets for his political opinions. Okay, that was a great summary on the moral side. Yeah, um, and then and what do you think about Peterson in terms of just the political side? We could touch on it briefly. Yeah, I, I think the okay the in my in my estimation the best peterson was right before he became extremely famous like yeah. that was the best peterson it was more authentic oh my goodness yeah and and you know i tried to be humble like like i tried to imagine what it means to be in his shoes like the level yeah. of attention like when everybody just seeks for answers like like they ask you for those answers and they give you the platforms they give you and they give you the money they give you yeah. for speaking one hour. I think that his, his speaking fee at, at one point was 40K. Like it was at insane, least. at least. I saw him in Atlanta. There was, oh. I think, 3,000 people that came out to see him and I think we each paid, I don't know, $100. Yeah, or yeah, so. yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is that, like, you know, when you, you become so used to being put in that pedestal, right? And just giving answers, giving answers, giving answers. I don't even know how he has enough time to study as he did before mm. or research or be alone in the quiet and yeah. reflecting of, on his own shadow. He might, I don't know. But I guess for me, the, the Peter, that was the best Peterson. Uh, and then the, the Bill C-16 happened when he, didn't, he, when he didn't want to be forced or enforced by law to use the pronouns. Uh, in 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 uh, the university in Canada, mm -hmm. and then 
And then I would say that there was like a, a, a change in Peterson. I, I think that he became more a neoliberal slash conservative. And he recently joined the Daily Wire, which is the, so to speak, the media group that Ben Shapiro is part of one of the owners, you know? Yeah. And so for me, that was the bad decision. And I, I have friends that are probably are watching me that they know they like Ben Shapiro a lot and they are subscribed to the Daily Wire. Uh, but I have no problem saying that I think that that was the wrong choice because I think that you want to surround yourself with people that will kick you in the butt. Mm. That will say, what are you talking about, man? And so you for, think he should have stayed more neutral maybe? or or At least surround himself with people who will definitely kick his butt and mm. who knows a lot more in many areas that, than, than he knows. Uh, so, for example, I would say that when... Um, just to give you an example, like if you watch the Slavo Zizek uh, and Jordan Peterson debate on communism or capitalism or things like that, you can tell that, you know, Jordan doesn't know much about Marxism right? as you would think based okay. on many of his uh, online criticisms to Marxism. Or for example, he would say things at times, many times I have a problem not so much with his beliefs, but the expression of his beliefs. You know, for example, you I'm going to use the typical Christian case because it's super polarized uh, and super, super ex extreme. It's extreme. You know, like you could you could still hold a sexual ethics that you feel like, no, only heterosexual couples can can be married before God. Or you can go to the street of New York and, and just put a, a poster saying homosexuals go to hell. Yeah. Right. So it's like, bro, what are you doing? Yeah. The, the second, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it might be the same belief, but the, the way you express the belief is also, it can also be a moral issue, either unloving or alienating and things like that. So I feel like with mm. Peterson, I have that issue that many times he says, uh, like, oh, Twitter rewards anger and so, so, so. But then I he tweets stuff mm -hmm. that I'm like, the way he tweets is like, for example, there was like a magazine of a sport where there was a chubby women on the, on the, on the, on the what's it? Uh, front. Sports Illustrated was yeah, it? Sport, yeah. yeah, exactly. And he said like, not beautiful, like in the tweet. Wow. It's like, bro. Yeah. Like, why? Yeah. Really, why? Mm. Like, yeah, you might disagree. He's getting a bit maybe dramatic, sensational. Right. He, he can get really feisty, really like, psh, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and, and also like, for example, um, when the, uh, Palestine, uh, Israel happened, like when the Palestine attack and it was known, like he tweeted, uh, like telling the Israel government to the Palestine, right? Like give them hell. Wow. Bro. Yeah. That's... Like, I don't get it. Like you, man, you are the beacon of truth. You have ex like a huge degree of influence. Why do you, why are you adopting a rhetoric? That is, that is so polarizing, that is so alienating, mm -hmm. that is not treating the otherness with kindness and, and, and building bridges for communication. And I do believe that the highest form of tolerance is conversing with the otherness, with a person that co thinks completely in, you know, different to you. And, and I think that there is a way of expressing belief that can build bridges or can alienate people. And I feel like I thought Peterson was all for building bridges and communication. But sometimes I, I just think yeah. that he is either uh, inconsistent with his own beliefs or, but I, I'm just surprised that cl people close to him, like allow him to do that and say, what are you doing, man? Yeah. This is not you. This is not, this is not embodying who you are, like, who, or what you endorse, or what you write in your books. But again, to some degree, he does embody many things that he writes and things like that. So I want to give a fair assessment. Um, I, I like Peterson a lot for his moral philosophy and psychological expertise. Not so much for his political views. I think it's very like... Or how he expresses them. Well, yes, how especially how he express, expresses them. But also, like, I feel like... Um, he presents uh, the left, the the left ideology or the left mm, position in the most extreme of its branches or, or expressions. Yeah. Right. And so, for example, I would say that even though I don't identify or I don't sympathize with the media left, the left from the media or what goes viral, like I'm like, that has nothing to do with me. I then I read uh, educated left-leaning philosophers or positions. And I was like, oh, I'm actually I think I'm more left-leaning than mm -hmm. I thought, but but not from what I watch online. 
it's from what I'm reading from the books and things like that. So anyways, that I think I think the yeah. one challenge maybe is that there's so much uh, like the left can also be at least in North America. And I don't know how it is in Europe, but the left can also be very inflammatory. They oh, can yes. Be, um, disrespectful. They can say things of outbursts. And even with Peterson, he's been to I mean, in his own country, he's been pretty much kind yes. of exiled and yes. he's come back. I think he's been back and forth from Toronto in yes. the U.S., but he's been, uh, he used to do speeches and then they would throw stuff or ruin his, his speeches on campus and, and, and things like that. So do you think that maybe he just feels like he needs to kind of fight back? It's kind of like they're playing dirty, so maybe he has to also play a little bit dirty or... Yeah, I think, fair enough. I think it's really hard for you to keep a level of kindness and, mm. and empathy when you are just faced continually with hostility. Yeah. Right, right, right. Fair enough. It's, it's just a human element. And I, I, again, I cannot even imagine what it means to wake up as a Jordan Peterson mm. and, and the level of attention and, and, and engagements and, and criticism. Like, I can't even imagine. I remember, I remember interviewing one friend uh, for his uh, his stage four cancer. I, I we had a conversation, not even an interview, and I get a lot of backlash because they said that I was interrupting too much. But we were just talking, and mm. and I didn't feel that, even though I asked my wife after, and she told me, yeah, you were interrupting a little bit much, mm -hmm. uh, and so I took it. But people were so mean in the comments, man. It's like, bro, like my friend is dying and we're, we're having a conversation and you know, and the, the only thing you write in the comments is how terrible I am. Wow. Like, I, like it's really hard for me to comprehend yeah. why people do that. Yeah. Like what, what moves them to just write mean comment, even if they are true, the way they express it is very hurtful. And so this I had to stop reading because it was messing me up. I understand I have to grow, but man, like, do you guys have children, brothers, sisters? Do you talk to them like that? Like, I don't think so. Yeah. And, and so, fair enough. I would say that, yes, I, I do have a lot of criticism for the radical left. I do not like the rhetoric either. I feel like anything that is unidimensional, like meaning, oh, the, the problems with the world is everything is about power. Mm. Or every or is oppressor and oppressed. Well, sorry, no, because the same person can be an oppressor and oppressed at the same time. So mm. I don't believe in these cla classing people like that in these dichotomies of zero ones. I, f I believe in nuances, in decrease, in the spectrum. And I feel like in the end, it comes down to love. I think that the problem with, I feel like the one of the greatest risks of the left is that they recreate the mechanism of hate that they are trying to abolish. Wow. And so, and so I think that it's very hard to pursue justice. And then you becoming the, the monster or becoming that which you want to eradicate in the world. It's very easy because, well, I was reading a, an essay on the sources of violence, right? And whenever you read the greatest forms of violence towards collective or other people there is always the best excuse ever like mean, meaning like this like a scapegoat oh you are sexist you are all of these then we need to eradicate or re-educate you and things like that and that's why you deserve all of this hostility and so that is the that, that is the paradox of the being tolerant right because mm -hmm. for you to be tolerant with everybody you have to be intolerant with the group that is intolerant so it's, it's like a paradox it, it never ends so what I'm trying to say, it's not possible. You you always speak from a moral inclination that you take as truth. So I don't believe in neutrality, really. I believe mm. I, I don't I don't I don't believe like you can just judge things impartially or neutral. We always speak from a moral orientation that we take as truth or we always speak from a hierarchy of value that of things that you consider more important than other things or good or evil and things like that. Even if you claim that you don't believe that. So, so you're saying like nobody is is objective. In that oh sense. no, like no! Everybody's kind of biased. Yes, right? that is correct. We don't we don't think without biases. We think through them. That is a yeah. that is our starting point. Yeah. Now, then you could be more self-critical and and try to, but there is no doing without biases. There is yeah. no you can escape your human condition. Sorry, you can't. But that that should give you humanity. That should say, oh snap, I do have my inner demons, my inner shadow. You know, so let me be careful that when I correct this sexist person, I don't become tyrannical. 
in the pursuit of justice. It's very easy to become tyrannical when you are pursuing justice. Very, very easy. Because you've, then you become the vehicle for redeeming the world and things like that. But again, it's really hard to do it out of love and not out of hate, you know? So how do you do that? I think that you can only have an inner transformation. I think that you need to, I'm gonna use this language just to get this point across. You need to hate enough the world to want to change it, but you need to love enough the world or the people in the world to do it in a way that will not make you tyrannical. Something yeah. like that. It's really hard to articulate, but it's something like that. Yeah, I remember when Elon Musk mentioned, I can't remember which podcast, but he said something along the lines of, free speech only works when you let someone say something you disagree with. And lately with all the canceling and censorship and shadow banning, it's, and I'm not saying in all those cases, everyone should be able to say everything, right? right? But it does feel a little bit tyrannical, right? And, and people, a number of people may feel they can't express their true feelings, their truth, right? Um, when on some sides, people say, oh, I want to express my truth. That's the ultimate value of life or whatever. But then they're not letting other people also express what mm -hmm. they believe, right? Um, and you mentioned that, you know, creating tyranny to oppose previous tyranny or oppression yes. isn't always the best answer. For example, let's just say, let's talk about uh, sexuality, the sexual revolution, yes, right? Yes, like yes, yes. in the past, there was uh, bias, discrimination, hate towards, let's say, you know, homosexuals or different, yes. different expressions of, of, of attraction or gender, etc. Yes. cetera. Um, and then, but then now it's almost to the point where it's sort of the left has their view and it's like, you have to believe this. You have, you know, trans, yes. you have to let yes. children, um, I don't want to get too controversial here, but you have to let children, you know, do yes. gender uh, transition at age nine or 10. And, and someone might say, no, I disagree with that. Yes. And I think those are both valid points that people should be able to express in debate without being canceled or being, there was a person that in Canada that got put to jail when his, I believe it was his son or daughter, was transitioning to another gender and he told the doctors, no, I'm not going to let my 10 year old or whatever it was, uh, a minor transition because he's my, my child. And then he got, I think, put to jail or he's in a legal proceeding, criminal proceeding, you know? Um, anyways, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting topic about the aspect of, we all have our own lens that we look at things and it's so easy to, um, Say, hey, we, I believe in tolerance, but at the same time, but I'm not tolerating that thought. Right. right? I, I feel like it's, it's this. I'm this only being tolerant of things that I'm tolerant of, right. not I, what you said. I you think know? that the, the, the left, the radical left can, can be very for uh, di diversity in terms of ethnicities and, thi and you know, orientations. Sexual expression. But, yeah. but not so much when it comes to ideas. Yeah. Like, yeah. like there is this official, like you have to think this way. And if you deviate from that, then you are either committing hate speech, hate crime. You are homophobic, transphobic and all of that. And I think that it is complicated, right? Because these words are really inflammatory. I, again, I don't know to what extent this is, you know, the viral, the protesters and th like the loudest people. Yeah. Because I would say that in the academia, there are ways of carrying out these discussions, you know, that can be valid. But it's true that the problem is that when it comes to legislations and things like that, it's getting tricky. And, you know, the honest answer is that, I don't know. I think that the issue of political correctness, one thing I would say, though, is that, you know, the, the right criticizes the left for being for being political, for politically correct. Right. Not saying things as they are because of controversy and things like that. But I would say that the right also have some form of political correctness. There are things that they don't allow like they. So so I would say that for me, I defend the right for you to have your opinion. But once you say your opinion, I might criticize your opinion 
for sure. heavily. For, that's yeah. for sure. So, so in that sense, I do believe in that. But I would say that even on the right, there is some form of political correctness. I mean, the, the scandal now was like the Candace Owens and Fire. I don't know if you know that. The, no. The, the Daily Wire had Candace Owens, this black conservative woman, very loud, anti-climate change, many <laughs> things like that. Okay. So she was fired and by, by having beef with Ben Shapiro and things like that. Regarding uh, Israel. Regard, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so, so that's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that the right is also extremely hostile with some form of a speech. Mm-hmm that is coming from the left or from other views that oppose them. So it's not like they are not like when, when conservative people say, Oh, you should call just sex, not gender. And all that, that is a form of correctness right. of a speech. Mm-hmm. So, so maybe they don't prosecute you or send you to jail. That might be one thing. But what I'm trying to say is that they are playing the same games. That's what I'm trying to say. They are, they are both embodying some form of political correctness because we all have a sense of what is proper to say and what is, not proper to say for example the comedians oh does humor and 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 comedy that does comedy have ethical limitations or or should should comedy have ethical boundaries i would say everything has ethical boundaries even consent you know the consent is not the ultimate expression of of the will because for example you cannot give yourself uh you cannot offer yourself to me as a slave like it's not by law you can't even do that because it is understood that there are things that you, even though you might consent, it is immoral. Yeah. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that there's always this macro or and you can, we could go use the metaphor of high or super low, like there's an underlying, uh, what would you say, moral intuition that is, you know, there at play. But I would say that, yes, is this ingenuous in my opinion to just paint the other opinion as oh like hate crime and all of this and just shut down the doors of the the communication you know just because you think this is the way things should be and that you have a full grasp of the truth and nobody else and they are brainwashed and things like that i don't like that rhetoric i i think that that is a form of dehumanization and when you do that well it's tricky man it's tricky i i do not i'm not a fan of that so yes i I complete. I, this is a book that I would like to write in the future about the whole thing of how the queer theory started, gender ideology, the trans issue, and things like that. This is something that I want to write in conversation with academics from the LGBTQ plus community. So I want to write a survey of how we got to the point we got in a more mm-hmm. less polarized manner to elevate the, the discourse, you know, to understand. I hope you do that. I and be- then I will write another book positioning myself and why do we believe that this is a, not okay? Or, and, you know, some things might be permissible at, at a legal level and some things morally at a personal level I don't condone, period. You know, I don't condone heterosexual couples being together with outside of marriage <laughs> at a spiritual, like at a moral personal level. That doesn't mean that I'm going to forbid it in law right right those are two different discussions because we live in a democracy and so the the democracy democratic sovereign states follow like a mix of you know the constitution plus procedimental ethics right so the good is 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 dictated by the agreement of the majority so the good is defined by the conclusion of the majority not by a preconceived notion of the goodness. So if the, if the majority decides that this is okay to do in this sovereign state, then that's what we get. And that's the, that's the a democratic state. That's, that's how things are arranged. Uh, and so that's what, that's where we live. Is it better than a kingdom? Perhaps. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I guess it depends on the king. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's dangerous to give uh, so much power to one person, but I would say that, you know, it, it is tricky. It is tricky. I, I would say that I just want to encourage everybody, you know, whether you are on the left, in the spectrum, really radical left, pro everything, uh, and anti conservatives and all of that, just to, to, to ask yourself, what is the spirit of love and truth that I should embody when talking to my fellow human being, yeah. even if they are against my lifestyle. And I think that love is always the answer, in my opinion. Um, Yes. And love, love is not ideological agreement. You know, you can, because there is a difference between approving and accepting somebody. Mm. So, for example, I, I can accept you as a human being, as my fellow human being, and extend love and care for you without approving of all of the things that you think about sexuality or political views. Yeah. I could sit down with uh, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro and treat them as, you know, treat them super nicely. And that doesn't make me a fascist or whatever they want to call me, which I think is also a, an, an 
unfair criticism to them, you know? So that's what I'm trying to say. Like even Jesus Christ, for those people who are believers, Jesus in the, among the 12, there was Simon the Zealot and, and then Matthew the tax collector. So there you have it. So the, zeal, the Zealots in the first century was, a, it was like a group that of Jews that typically use violent means to overthrow the Roman Empire that they were under. And the tax collector was a worker for the Roman yeah. Empire to tax the Jews. And these two people were among the 12. It's something like having Bernie Sanders, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but more like an Antifa, more violent even, you know, like a more yeah. violent person, like anti an Antifa, Bernie Sanders type of me member. Or, or neoliberal, like, yeah, 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 no, no, this, yes, exactly. They want to get rid of the big state or control. And then you have the tax collector, you know, like AOC, Al yeah. uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or something yeah. like that, you know, pro-government, heavy taxation, everything regulated and all of that. Yeah. They were among the 12. Yeah. But they have, they have a hierarchy of loyalties. So they, yes, they have a political loyalty. They, they felt, hey, I do believe that this is the expression of how it should be. But my highest form of loyalty is to Christ, to the spirit of love and truth. And because in this hierarchy of loyalty, Christ was at the pinnacle that was able to overcome the micro disunities across wow. other topics. Does that make sense? And so that was what unites them. So it's something like what unites us is greater than what divides us, something like that. And so. I want to encourage people that, fair enough, have your own view, wrestle with the truth and all of that, but please, let's have this highest form of loyalty to the spirit of love and truth. And wow. I feel like if we, do, if we do embody and have this biggest loyalty to the spirit of love and truth, we can overcome the micro disunities. If we are united in that type of loyalty to love and truth, I think there is a real possibility that we can have real conversations without killing vision. one another. So. I love that vision. Would you would you say that now you mentioned I like this concept of hierarchy of loyalty, hierarchy of value, yes. hierarchy of meaning. I think Jordan Peterson has also yeah. talked about that yeah. or, you know, he's written that book, Maps of Meaning as yes. well, I think. Well, phenomenal that. book. I haven't read it, but I've heard about it. It's, it's, I think his best book in moral philosophy and moral psychology. I think for anybody you want to get the, the good Jordan Peterson for moral and, and moral psychology and moral philosophy, Maps of Meaning. Hmm amazing so we as humans we all have you know our psychology we have these i guess maps of meaning yes talks about right <laughs> mental maps maps of meaning hierarchy of value we can call it anywhere yeah right yeah yeah and and do you think that so you mentioned in that case that there were two different people within the apostles of of jesus back yes. in the in those times where they had very different mid-level um hierarchies of values one was a tax collector politically yeah politically one's yeah. a tax collector where they basically profit off of taking money from the jews <laughs> yes and their their real paycheck is coming from the roman government which yeah. was their enemy yeah and yes. their colonizer yeah oh yes even worse so the jews were being oppressed and then you had another one that was basically almost you could say like a separatist or a yes someone abolitionist of some sort yes. they wanted to free israel yeah. or the jews that is from correct the roman empire so but you said that the the, the higher, the, the top part of that hierarchy of value that is correct. became something else. Yes. Which was a message of this, this figure of the Jesus. The person of Christ, yes. And what he embodies, yes. Who they were living with and, and going around with and hearing him preach and, and absorbing that. Yes. So would you say now, do you think that whether left or right, people have kind of dissolved the, the hierarchy in terms of, maybe in the past people would have a religious over 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 overbearing yes. value and then now that's gone away because of secularism and now that mm. political view becomes the top of the pinnacle so the left for the left it's whatever the identity oppressor things of that nature equality and for the right it might be something else do you, do you think that's something at play here oh there has been a huge sh change in 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 so to speak, the macro or the most common hierarchy of values that people adopted. And when I say hierarchy of value or loyalties or vision or conception of the good life and things like that, just for the audience, this, this is 
typically unarticulated. And this is really important to say. So it, because people claim to believe some things, but their true beliefs is what they embody in their mm. daily life. And typically it's extremely difficult to articulate linguistically or with wor words or to verbalize what you really believe. Typically we have hunches or stored feelings in our body, right? Like some, sometimes it happens to you, right? You just feel off. And you mm. don't know what happened in that interaction. And then days later, you you name it and say, like, oh, that was that, that is what I was feeling. So same thing with beliefs or conceptions of the goods and things like that. We are the thing. The thing to make clear is that you cannot live without a conception of the good. There is a hyper good. There is something at the pinnacle of your hierarchy of value. There is a loyalty to some conception of of, of the good, whatever that is, that is guiding and orienting you in your life. That is mm. inescapable. It's not like you can do without that, period. So the question is, if what is at the pinnacle is a tyrannical voice or is the voice of love and truth? That is a good question to ask, mm. right? And so, and so, or if you are hearing it, if you are paying attention to that which is calling you higher, you know, and moving away from hell. <laughs> mm. That's another way of thinking about it. But, you know, I would say that yes, for example, in the medieval times, like the believing in God or in, a, in the divine or in a higher power was something unproblematic, you know, and you see a shift in the values of people in modern times. You're saying it was just very common. It was just everyone took it as a default. As, yes, as taken for granted, as part of yeah. their background understanding, as, as yeah. the way th they, the, and the way they, they imagine, feel and experience the world was like that god was a fact of reality the same way the the wall we are looking at is a fact of our physical reality so it was like that and this is a concept of, from social sciences social imaginary this is a, co a good concept because social imaginary is different to social theory because social imaginary is trying to analyze the what would you say the background understanding of the default way of experiencing life without active interpretation or without reflecting? Like, how do you just imagine your life by, by default when you just go on with your life on the day? You know, so that's how people imagine that, oh, there is a cosmic order hmm. that this earthly order is trying to emulate. The monarch, the priest, the pope, they are there to, to make sure that we embody the higher form of order, this cosmic order, and protect us from evil spirits. That was the reality. That was taken for granted. The same way we take for granted gravity, <laughs> like, like that. And so they didn't think philosophically about it. So what happened is that back then in the medieval times, for example, in Latin Christendom, uh, they, they have a conception of human flourishing. But human flourishing wasn't the highest form of good. It was God. So when God asks you to sacrifice your flourishment or whatever, or your, what would you say, living a good life, maximizing comfort, reducing suffering in this life, when God calls you, hey, I need you to sacrifice your comfort and your life and what you have for the spiritual reality. Okay, fair enough. So, but what, what happened in modern times, in modernity, and in the West especially, is that for the first time, human flourishing became the ultimate form of goodness. Mm in this in the imminent reality like in just earthly that's sphere. what we believe now that's what we believe now default. yes we maximize comfort and we minimize sacrifice and we try to we are obsessed in finding the right person the right house the right outfit the, all of that because it's this obsession with project self self-fulfillment this is you create the meaning of you create good and evil for yourself you are the uh what would you say the master of your own story something like that and so Do what feels good this is the driving ethos of the Western Find culture. Find your truth. That is correct. So the ethics of authenticity would be, right? Be authentic, be all of that. <clears throat> and that typically expresses itself in very toxic ways. Mm. You know, promiscuity, hedonism, uh, sh shallowness, uh, people become means to an end, not ends in themselves. Uh, transactional yeah, relationships. Transactional, shallow relationships. No, there is no a call for sacrifice. That's why people decide, oh, I, I think that part of the big number of people who, for example, don't want to have families is like, oh, I don't want that. Like, mm. And so this is based now on the framework of this uh, consumer uh, framework of relationship versus the covenantal relationship. I don't know if you want me to explain that to... Sure, but... go, about, go ahead, yeah. So... <clears throat> So before relationships were built 
or predicated upon an objective truth, a higher, a highest form of good that was in God, in the mind of God, in the universe, in nature, something like that. But it's something. It was something beyond what was convenient or what you felt like doing, right? So there was a covenant. You had like a pact. A, a, co a contract is not the right word, but anyways, like you were, you you took vows. Like I I have this vow and I'm going to die, and my promise counts has a lot of value my word that's why word giving your word in the past yeah. had tremendous value you know and so that was and so the idea is that what the way you take care of people is based on a higher form of good beyond what you feel like doing or not doing and so it was covenantal in that sense i feel like now because of human flourishing and the rise of capitalism and things like that now we have a consumer type of framework of relationship right like I go to a vendor and I give you X amount of money. You give me this product of these services. If I don't like, if I find flaws in your product and I have more money and I can get a better product or service, I'm going to go to the next vendor and replace you, yeah. right? Because I'm investing in this. And so I need to get something better. But, and this has been extrapolated into interpersonal relationships, you know? So now if you, if your partner or wife, you know, you are not compatible enough sexually or he or she doesn't look the same way or he is not everything you want in a man and things like that, then ah, you replace it. It's transactional. Mm. You just replace it because the product is not good enough for the investment you are giving. But before it was covenantal. You know, it's not about you. It's about you embodying a sacrificial spirit to take care of this other human being and until death do us part. Right. And so, and it's a completely different framework. And the best way to put it is like, if I were to, for example, I have a child, I have a, a one year old, one year and a half, uh, one year and a half old, like uh, my baby boy, Aiden. Like if I were to say now, just for people to even imagine what I'm talking about with this covenantal relationship, if I were to say, oh, you know what? Taking care of Aiden doesn't fulfill me enough. It's not intellectually stimulating <laughs> and I have better things to do. And so, you know, I give up. I, I don't want to be your father anymore. Good luck, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were to do that, many of you watching and you yourself yeah. would find that completely reprehensible. Yeah. Because you, even though you don't have the word covenantal relationship, you implicitly in your intuition and in your gut feeling knows that that is wrong. That that is not correct. Yeah, you made a commitment to yeah. your father. You had that child. That you is chose. A, yes, that is a covenantal relationship, which it means that I'm his protector, I'm his provider, and I'm going to take care of him. Not even it, when it gets really hard and I don't feel like doing it, right? And that's what implies to be a father, so, a benevolent father, you know? And I feel like before husbands have the same idea. It was a covenant, and wives too. That was a covenantal relationship. The same way we will feel outrage if a father says something like that about his son like the, yeah. like what are you talking about carlos like how are you gonna give up just because it's not enticing or stimulating enough to be a dad of aiden like you you shouldn't do that sorry Get, grow up that's mm -hmm. what we would say grow up and deal mm -hmm. with it right mm -hmm. but we would not advise oh yes just quit bro find a different child that mm -hmm. that you might like more like that's crazy that type but, of but do you think nowadays some people accept more like I understand the example for sure. That makes yeah. a ton of sense. But are you saying that within, let's say, married relationships, committed partner relationships, people feel differently than parental relationships? Where if they're not yes. feeling it, even if they got married, they committed to each other, do you think that people now think they can, you know, I'm not fulfilled, so I, I should just yeah, I uh, think get divorced or leave and separate? I think that the a lot of people have anchored their lives Mm. under this ideal of human flourishing and self-fulfillment as mm. the ultimate form of good. And I think that it's a bad recipe. Mm. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's not powerful enough to account for the suffering and the complexity of what you face in real life. Uh, life is brutal. And, and you want to live as much as possible. So it's delusional almost. You think? I, I, yes, I think it's, a, it, it, it's not... A, it's not that human flourishing and, and, and self-expression and self-fulfillment is a bad thing. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's part of, of this hierarchy of goods. Yeah. But what is delusional is to put it at the pinnacle. It, it, virtues have none mad. They are out of order. We need to yeah. rank them. Like it, they need to be in their proper place. Yeah. You know? And so in that sense, yes, it, it's the degree 
or the importance that we give to these ideals that are that have whoa a, a intense force right now is insane and yes i i do believe that that is delusional i don't think i, I think that wrong interpretations of the world they lead you to gulags broken families broken marriages concentration camps so be very wow. careful how you interpret reality very careful many many times we think oh ideas are there no man the mm. true ideas that you believe careful they yeah. build those concentration camps and they kill you mm. that's what i'm trying to say or they or they cheat on their wife and they abuse children those are the interpretations of the world you have to watch out and so and other interpretations of the world they some will of our desires may not be good oh absolutely right you shouldn't condone everything you feel that's uh, endorse or give in no and that's i think that's a tough boundary that's a that's yes. a tough boundary if you think yes. about it for yes. example if i'm married I know now there's ethical non-monogamy. I see that yes. online. Oh, people talk yes. about that or polyamory and all. there's all these <laughs> yes. different things people are experimenting with uh, to break off from traditional relationships. Uh, but that's a tough, that's a tough line to, to balance where, like you said, flourishing. So what does that mean? So if I'm married, I have kids, I have a wife, I've been married for 15, 20 years, but then Oh, you know, I have these desires to find another woman. Yes. Or even another man. Yes. Should I just do that? Because that's that's my flourishing in that moment. I right? think. Yeah, I think we have a conception of 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 selfhood that is very superficial. We self-identify with our strongest desires, not our deepest desires. So let let me give you a contrast, right? So. Harry Frankfurt was in his essay, the concept of a person, he was trying to discover the difference between animals and human beings. And he distinguishes, he make this classification between first order desires or primary desires and second order desires. So animals like us also, we have first order desires. Mm -hmm. what, what is given to us that you didn't do anything to feel it, right? So it's so that you, hunger. Like you feel hungry or you feel uh, aroused and you want to mate and mm. things like that. So those are given to you. Fair enough. So, but a tiger, we don't, we don't take a tiger to a court for having eaten a human being because we understand that the tiger is just following its instinct because a tiger is a carnivore, is a predator. Yeah. That's it. But surprisingly, we do take to court human beings who eat other human beings. Yeah, for sure. Right, because we understand that human beings have a ref moral reflective capacity, which that is the second order desires, meaning you, you can want not to want something, right? So for example, I might feel in my body that I want to, let's say, be unfaithful to my wife, but there is a, a deeper desire. That might be my strongest desire, but my deeper desires or my second order desires like, no, I mm -hmm. want to be a loyal husband. I'm a monogamous couple and I want to respect my wife. So I'm not going to do that. And so in any case, human beings define themselves by going against biology or first order desires all the times. I mean, think of the, of the monastic traditions, which I admire them immensely. You know, they are hungry, but they fast. They, they restrain from worry. They, they want to have sex, but they do, they may vows to not have sex and things like that for, for the ultimate form of good, you know, which for them is God. And so what I'm trying to say is that human beings are uh, defined essentially by having this reflective capacity over our first order desires to not be doomed to do what's most, you know, what was most expedient or easy in, in mm. our bodies. And I think that when I hear people saying like, oh no, just because I feel this, this is my highest form of good. It's like, bro, you are, you are self-identified with your more, most animal, animalistic side of you. That's yeah. not you. You are, yes, that desire is in you, but there are other many desires that coexist and that they are rival desires they are opposed so you know or values not even desires maybe a, a value. yeah or values you may not feel that desire in the moment for yes example, to be loyal or to right be but you still think like oh i should want this but i don't want it yes and so then and i think that yes i think that the way we exp we perceive things as important as being objectively true as calling us to something higher. You know, when you see somebody that is embodying kindness or humility or discipline, that draws you in because mm. these things are not relativistic. They, they just embody these goods and it, it draws you in. So you, it's not like you, you choose to feel the importance of this specific action. No, 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 no. That's not the way it works. It's like you perceive it mm. in your experience like, wow, 
Mm. And then and then you try to linguistically rationalize that or explain it somehow. But this idea that you create your own values is 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 just the most fallacious thing I ever heard. Like it's not true that you perceive the goodness in things and then you decide to do something about it. So in some ways morality is it's objective. absolute in some aspects. Maybe yes. we don't know exactly how, but there is something absolute about it. Yes, it's, me it's messy to articulate, but yes, yeah. I would say that morality is objective, yeah. but it's not objective in the sense that, oh, this is the code yeah. that applies to every single situation. No, it's not, it's not that. It's more like you, you don't make things good through a radical choice. Like you don't say, oh, I want, I want polyamorous relationships to be good. And then just because mm. I choose it to be so, then this is good. No. That or, or, or even it's more simply, I feel like doing or polyamory. Exactly. No. And I have yes. consent from mm. my, let's say I have consent too. Yes. So let's say I have my wife or my girlfriend right. give me consent. And just because you consent, that doesn't make it good. Yeah. Because you consent to immoral things. Yeah. And like you said, sometimes even consent can be, there's different levels. So maybe consent is important, not the most important. Maybe thing. I'm a high value man. I can get her to consent. Right. But maybe it's not actually what she well, even well, wants. Even, even the psychological literature yeah. already shows you that, that when a person is coerced or in a codependent yeah. relationship, the judgment of this person, just because they actively say yes. something, yeah. you understand that this person has been so manipulated that they are yeah. not in a good position to even know what they want. So just because you think it or you say it or you decide that doesn't make it good. Mm. And I feel like just because the the errors, the erotic energy in us is very strong. It's a very it can create life and wonderful things or it can destroy everything in your life. Like it's a very dangerous energy. And dangerous is neither neither good nor bad. It could be used it's a force. Yeah. It's like a hammer. Yeah. And so and so I think that yes, I, I do agree with you. It's is just because you feel it, just because you decide that doesn't make it right. Mm. Because beyond that, there is still the discussion if the object of your desire incorporates qualities that we all admire and cannot help but admire and recognize. Mm -hmm. You just might rationalize your way into doing what's easiest. Yeah. But even, even between spies, let's say that I'm a, you are a Russian spy and I'm an English spy, whatever. Even if I torture you and you tell me something about your nation, I was like, oh, it's convenient. You told me something I needed from you, but I still think, oh, what a weak man. Hmm. Right. So even if I profit from your lack of character, let's say that I yeah. still have a judgment morally to you that I do not admire you. Or you, you can see this even between great soldiers, right? Like they even admire the enemy from the courage of going to war and yeah. give their life. They respect that. Even, even if you don't agree with the entire thing of war, doesn't really matter. What I'm trying to say is that there are these goods that people embody that even if it's not convenient to you, even if it's convenient to you, you still can recognize some form of goodness in that. And I mean, think of, think of the voice of your conscience, you know, like it tells you things that you don't want to hear. Hmm. Where does that come from? It tells you things that you don't want to hear. And even if nobody sees you, you know, Wow. you know, hmm. wow. So that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of deep stuff. That's um, a lot. I want to, I want to touch on a little bit, um, kind of your living situation now and your vision for kind of the life you're trying to build as you finish the PhD, as you do teaching, scholarly work, writing uh, for people out there. And just to give context, so I, I think a lot of people in our generation, so 20s, 30s, maybe early 40s even, they can tend to feel trapped in mm -hmm. their situation. So maybe they're they, maybe they went to college, maybe they didn't, whatever. They're working nine to five. They, they're in the city they grew up in, the country they grew up in. They're trying to pay rent. They're working a job they maybe don't like. Yes. Um, they're following what their parents told them to do maybe, but it's just not working for them. But they feel like that's the only option they have. And so they maybe feel trapped in that situation. Um, I personally come from Toronto, Canada, where it's extremely expensive for rent. Homes are pretty much unaffordable at the average income levels or even above average income levels for most people. So you can't buy a house pretty much. Uh, but people think that's their only option. And so what I want to present a little bit to viewers here, and maybe it's not a fit for everyone, but just kind of presenting 
what you have done, what you've chosen to do to pursue maybe an alternative career path. I mean, you have a job, you're, you're doing things, but you know, maybe the thought process on where we are today and specifically like, you know, how you've come to that decision and, and even specifically, maybe if, if we could share like just economically how things are here versus even yes. in Madrid or if you were in New York or something like that, just as a comparison for people to open their minds. So that's the whole point of break the formula and that, right. that type of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I think that I have always been the type of person who for some weird reason, and I know this will sound very grandiose, pedantic, pompous, narcissistic. I have always known that I was created for greatness. I don't know why, because it didn't seem like I didn't, I didn't check the boxes that typical people who are end up being great. Like I didn't have that, you know, like, I, I yeah, was, you came from a difficult right, situation, so, situation family, dysfunctional family, like IQ. I thought I had a low, very IQ. So I, I low self esteem. I was, you know, very addictive tendency. So I was a mess. Um, I think for me it has always been Sometimes I was in confusion and, but I would say that we all in, in our, each of our situations, we all know, maybe we don't know our path clearly. We, we, maybe we don't see where are we heading a hundred kilometers or, or miles away from us. Maybe we are, we just managed to see the next one mile or yeah. kilometer. Maybe yeah. that's, that's all you can even, you know, envision right now because you are you feel so broken so stressed out so limited i would say so maybe that maybe that's you i would always tell people go against the odds mm. i know i know the the chances for some reason uh, like there are many things i've done i was even the victim of um this pyramid marketing like mla no more uh, mlm yeah multi-level marketing multi-level marketing i was poor i was in the streets i did flyers at night i i i've done it all man i've done yeah. it all i did construction work for a while so i've done it all that's what i'm trying to say and you might think that your life has been like just failure after failure but i don't think so i think that when you again when you when you when you let the spirit of truth, the spirit of goodness, the spirit of effort to possess you in that sense. And you let yourself be guided by that type of energy, uh, consciousness. I, I'm using many synonyms to help people com to convey this idea. When, when you just follow that path, th that voice, that, that immediate step, things will happen for some reason. And I feel like there are things that I've received, not because I was so great, but it just happens to be that I was the person knocking at the door. Yeah. Or some people tell me I'm helping you because you help yourself. Yeah. And I see how much you care and how much you're trained. So I do want to give you, give you help. And I think that always trying to have that attitude. Like, I, I don't know if I, I, they know I already have it. You know, they know I already have it. So let me see if I can get the yes from this person. Yeah. And so, yes, I was cheeky at times. Sometimes I didn't properly articulate the question or formulated the question to the person. I made many mistakes, many mistakes. But I would say that that was kind of like the curiosity of, okay, so I want something different and this seems to be the next step. So let me just take it. Because I think like it's very hard when people ask me, oh, Carlos, should I follow my passion? I, I And I say, I don't know what you mean because that wasn't the case for me. Like... I didn't discover what I wanted to do in the backing of my consciousness, like introspection or a meditative state. No, that wasn't that. I, I reflected on my situation. I was like, oh, I think I, I think I want to do this. Let me explore. Boom. Yeah. Jump, jump the gun. The did next it. Step that opened, gave it all. Gave it the all. Next opportunity that came up. Gave it all, and people said, "Oh, Carlos, again, you're you're changing paths." It's like, yeah, but I needed to explore. I did. I thought I liked it. Then I realized that I hated it. So let me, let me move on. Let me explore. And so I guess through, through action and self exploration and through giving it all and through going against the odds, I was able to find out to, to like, it's almost like a trace, you know, you are, you are, you are like a, a investigator seeing the cues, meaningful cues, hmm. like things that draw you and you, you are not exactly what that is and you just pursue it. And then you just say, okay, I think it's next, next. And I cannot believe I have my dream job now. 
Like, I, I cannot believe. Like, if you tell me seven years ago, six, or you're going to be married with this person, a baby, this house, yeah. like, I cannot believe it. And part of the reason, and but again, you have to take, you have to take action, man. Like, it's almost like sheer violence at times. It's it's legit. You you Sheer violence. You're going to feel sad. You're going to feel depressed. Just show up. Just do what you need to do. Do it well. Do it consistently. Don't give up. And you somehow things the heavens will open to you. Mm. Like you will see the door. Um, but I have a question though. Like, yes. were there some times where you just felt, "What the heck am I doing?" Like you just felt doubt on your path. Like for example, you mentioned you were doing your masters in in philosophy, and then you were also working as a teacher, and you were making I think eleven hundred dollars a month. Yes. And your wife was making $350 a month. Yes. And you guys were thinking, oh, maybe we'll have kids one day, but you're living in Madrid. Yes. Madrid continues to get more expensive as major cities in the world are, are becoming more expensive. So did you ever have moments where you're just like, what the heck am I doing? Maybe I should just give up on this passion of philosophy and just do a real job. Yes. And yes. try to make more money. Yes. A lot of people actually told me to get into sales and move to the U.S. And I could have made so much money because of my temperament, charisma. A lot of banking people, like mm. in banking, they told me, bro, if I got you into sales, mm. do you want to do this? I know I'm going to pursue philosophy. They, they couldn't get it. Um, yes, absolutely. I think that they, I remember even one night we didn't have money at all for dates or anything like that. We were broke, very limited money to do anything. And I promised myself that night, I remember I was so frustrated that I, I couldn't even take my wife for a, a, a kebab or like things like, like wow. we were so tight, man. And, and I was like so mad, like with just the situation that I promised, I'm going to learn how to use money and I'm going to learn how to get out of here. Like I just knew it. Like, and then I, start, I started reading books on finances because I wasn't taught that my family had money, but they spent it all. Yeah. And so they were always in debt and things like that. And so I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to learn that. Mm. I'm going to break the cycle or yeah. break, <laughs> break the formula. Yeah, the like, formula. Like, no way. This is not happening. And so, again, to me. And so I, I went at it and, and I feel like, yes, there were many moments of self-doubt. What am I doing and things like that. Again, I think that I follow what was meaningful not what was easiest and i think that in my personal case following just the money that was kind of like the easiest option to some degree you know but then even madrid we wanted to have an apartment so i we were living in madrid madrid is extremely expensive right now the real estate and we moved to to toledo the province of toledo an hour and 20 minutes away and we bought you know le long story short we basically bought a nice apartment right now uh, recently like four bedrooms two bathroom 150 meters square you know here in talavera really cheap for a, f a fourth of the price compared to what i would have paid uh we would we would have paid in madrid and so i what i'm trying to say is that there is always something you can do and it might seem minuscule it might seem it might seem really small like it might, it might seem really small for example even shifting from working at home to just going to the library that was already a constraint like okay my mom she is 56 she she works for the, she bathed the elderly like in, mm. in residencies mm -hmm. she goes there she feeds them clean the houses bathing naked they, they are sick and all mm. of that and she gets paid i believe less than a thousand euros a month wow wow for 30 hours a week wow so whenever i want to complain i i remember my mom i was like bro i have it really good mm. just go to the library and stop complaining mm. and yes it's a bad day so what it's okay tomorrow will be a better day and so i think that having that taking that into account that your emotions do not define your day to or, or or your path but you know what what is true or meaningful or that which draws your attention or that which presents itself when you aim higher yeah follow that man follow that and it's not gonna be easy and you're gonna feel lazy and you're gonna feel inadequate and you're gonna feel imposter syndrome all of that i would say just keep at it show up show up work hard and i and i think that it's very difficult to to extrapolate a rule but i would say that just don't don't get resentful it's, it's very dangerous mm. to get resentful just mm. be hard working no don't be a victim i think that is even if you are like there are people who are objective like legitimate victims yeah but even then they go to therapy to not live as victims even though they were true victims that's yeah. it that's the irony all right just after a little technical difficulty they were back online um 
so Carlos, um, we were kind of talking about the path of doing what you believe that you were meant to do or that you're passionate about, even if in the short term there's a lot of sacrifice. Yes. You'd mentioned that you had job opportunities to go to the U.S., work in sales, work in finance, potentially mm -hmm. make a lot more money. But for some reason, you decided to stay in Madrid, work for very low pay, uh, and then on the side, do your master's program. And now you're, you're finishing your Ph.D. Um, so for you, I guess, would you say, you know, has it been easy? Has it been hard? Like what's been? Yeah. How has that been? What's been the most challenging part about that? Yeah, I think it's. I think part of it is like, I, I feel like sometimes people do not want to dream, or maybe better put, sometimes people don't want to acknowledge their true wild dreams. Yeah, they have them. Yeah, but the, but they are so like if they become true, it's so scary that they 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 sh shut them down. Like like shh, like yeah, quiet them. You know what I mean? Because, because the problem is that once you recognize that you want something, you open the door for disillusionment, for disappointment, for failure, if you don't achieve that. So it's, it's very risky, right? Like emotionally, it's tough on you. So I would say that, yes, for example, uh, in my case, the lift experience of going through these three years uh, or master and things like that is less uh, sexy or like people glamorize too much sometimes the hero journey or the yeah. or success is 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 very quiet many days is very journey kind of sucks actually, yeah i think yeah it's, it's very quiet nobody yeah. sees you nobody's nobody roots for you it's lonely it's lonely when when you don't want to do anything else and or something needs to be done and you looked around it's just you again. Yeah, yeah. it's just you again you have to write the paper you have yeah. to edit the video and it is true that when when things start taking some track like getting some traction in, in in your career then when when now when you are more capable now people want to help you you know yeah. so it's, it's like a paradox man like when you most need it there's very there are very few people there like you have to do most of it and then and then when you least need it everybody wants to have you over talk to you and things like that which again i'm not saying this in a resentful way it's just very it's like very paradoxical the way reality works in that sense you know uh, it reminds me always of the scripture that says that to the ones who have very little even that i will take away yeah. and for the ones that have a lot i will give them more and he's talking about the parable of the talents right that the person was given one talent another person three talents and another person five talents a talent was a currency back in the first century uh, jewish setting and and the one talent guy out of out of fear for for losing the one talent uh, he buried it under 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 earth right and he didn't invest it. he didn't tr try to do something with it and the master came and said what do you do like you were in a good servant you should have done something with what i gave you even if it was one talent mm. and the and the person with three talents they got back six talents and the person with five got ten and so it's like oh good servants and things like that and i think that that's how life works man even if you got one talent do something with it you might get two but that hey more power to you that is already an amazing accomplishment. And so I think that just do with do something with whatever you got. That is personality, beauty, whatever, intelligence, I think you can always m improve things a little bit. Or you can create hell in your life by becoming resentful and bitter and becoming a victim of your own story. And so I would say that it's less sexy. Many days is very it's very monotonous. I think that greatness is created by monotony. You yeah. just do like the Olympians, right? Like you just do the same jump, the same movement a thousand like thousands and thousands of times until you just get it right. The way it should be or fast enough or whatever. And I feel like with writing is a saying, it's a very daunting process. Yeah. It's a love hate relationship with your craft. And, and it's tough, man. Many days I don't sleep well because I have a baby and I still have to show up and write something and, and keep making progress. But I would say that, yeah, I, I think that there is, that is why it's important to have this emotional sobriety about life, you know, like learning to love the, the, the greatness, the grind, the, the craft. And I think that that's why I don't, I don't really like people to be fully motivated by money. 
you know, like by profit. I think that you, they should seek for something that it's okay if you want to make a lot of money. But what I'm trying to say is that, in my opinion, it's even better if you can make money by not even thinking about money because you love your craft and you create so much yes. value through that. Does yes. that make sense? And so, yeah. So I would say that that's, that is the lift experience. It's very quiet, lonely many times, and monotonous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No one's cheering for you. Well, my wife is. That's good. That's and, a good thing. About and being now married. you and other closer yeah. friends, uh, that's for sure. So now it's changing, right? Yeah. But, oh, man, it was lonely. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you know, something that really opened my eyes coming here to, what's this place called again? Talavera de la Reina? Talavera de la Reina. So this is the, the town City. that yeah. you chose to, to live in because you had mentioned you were in Madrid. Madrid's very expensive to rent. Yes. What would it be for a apartment like this in Madrid for rent? Oh, a apartment like this for rent? Or El Retiro Park or something. No, this would be, to rent at least, what, 2K? Yeah. Minimum, minimum. 2,500. 2, and that's a lot here. That, yeah. that's, a, that's a good salary. Full-time, yeah. full good salary net. Uh, and buying, this this apartment would be, I would say, half a million at least, at least. in Madrid. And yeah. here it was less than 100K. Yeah, and so that's that's something that, that I've been really, like it's opened my eyes and I've traveled a lot. I've been to many yes. countries and, and you know, I'm an experienced traveler and I've lived in many countries, but even just coming here to Talavera de la Reina, I've never heard of this town before. It's an hour and 20 minutes. I took a bus from the bus station in Madrid. I got right to the, the station here, saw a very charming uh, town center. There was a, a El Cortez department store. Yes, that I, Corte Inglés. Yeah. Corte Inglés, sorry. Yes, Corte Inglés. That I got right off of the bus. I was in the department store. Uh, beautiful, like I said, town square. We picked up food at the bakery. Within a couple of minutes walk, we're at your apartment. Yes. And we're on the top floor, eighth floor, overlooking the town. And then there's the hillside, the beautiful landscape um, around the town that we're able to see here. And what a great place. I mean, you have four bedrooms. You have, you have, so you have a home office. You have... One bedroom for your child, one bedroom for you and your wife, another guest room. Guest room, yes. Two uh, bathrooms. And this living room. This living room and, and, and terrace. And a lot of windows. You have a terrace. And you bought it for less, if I could share it, you, you mentioned less than 100,000 euros. 95K to be precise. Euros, right? In yes, today's euros. economy. That's, in today, that's insane. That is insane. I mean, we're not in the middle of nowhere. We're, we're in the middle of a town with real people yeah. and stuff going on. And there's a bus right there. And train. And yeah, we have everything. everything. Yeah. Library. Yeah. It's all within yeah. walking distance. Yes. Yeah. And, and what I think of is, you know, there's other ways, th this really taught me that there's other ways to live. Maybe it's not a fit for everyone to move to a, a medium sized town in Spain, but there's options out there. Like it's opened my eyes, like even for me, yeah. right? Where, you know, if you're taking a risk in your career to start a business, to become an intellectual, to maybe start selling online, whatever, whatever you're doing, starting a new career path, if you're able to work remotely, oh, what an opportunity to be able to move to somewhere like this, right? Where your mortgage payment yes. is what four hundred dollars a month or something? A little bit less, even three three seventy a month. Groceries here are fairly cheap. Cheers. Good quality food. Yes, yes, yes. Like you can live very yeah. good life. Have a workspace. Go to the gym. Stay focused. Move go to restaurants, family, yeah, cocktail yeah. bars. Everything's nearby here. Yes for a very reasonable price compared to living in New York, LA, Toronto, all these other places where you have to make money to really live a good quality of life. You have to make at least, I don't know, 8K gross probably. Yes. I feel like yes. 8, 10K gross, especially if you have a kid and you have a wife. So that's what I just want to end off with for, for the viewers. Like I'm consistently just amazed, you know, seeing how people that break the formula live their life. And I think it's an opportunity to, for people to explore, um, you know, maybe potentially leaving your, your hometown for a season or for a long period of time to be able to focus on your craft, to be able to lower your expenses while still living a high quality life, still being productive. There's opportunities out there. Yeah, and, and to that, I don't, I've, to, to that, I would say that what helped us the most is that we both were working full time but we were living with, with less than 50% of our home income to be able to invest or, or pursue some dreams. So I feel like 
people just buy i many of the things i buy second hand yeah uh, i have a opel corsa it's a really cheap car yeah. you know it, it costs less than a toyota <laughs> imagine yeah uh, and things like that so i feel like I feel like at times people have this preconception of success, but they should think outside the box and really ask themselves what they value most. You know, for me, career is something really important for following philosophy or having my family, a roof, uh, you know, a place that we own and things like that is really important. And so I feel like lifestyle inflation is real. And I feel like a lot of people I see when I go to the States, I'm always yeah. surprised that people eat out all the time. They get Starbucks. It's like, they don't they make okay money but they also spend so much and, yeah. and at the same time i feel like what i'm trying like what i'm trying to say is that there are always creative ways you can make a space to save to invest and and, and things like that and then pursue what's meaningful to you and and you know and make that call and obviously i'm i'm lucky uh, you know I'm, I'm married to the right person <laughs> although you always marry the wrong person in some senses because full compatibility is just an illusion you build that as you go alone with a partner. But, you know, we have a great foundation. We love one another in this covenantal relationship, not consumer yeah. relationship. And and I think that it has been awesome. I, I'm glad that my wife sees, you know, the value in the things I do. And it's not like, oh, I want more clothes. So I mm. want to travel. And like, yeah, I mean, there have been many sacrifices that she has not, she has not gotten many things so that we could be at this point like here owning these and and being able to do what we're doing now so yeah yeah and, and my instinct is this is just the beginning like you're oh, just yes. about to finish your phd yes. you're starting to do traveling scholarly work i'm getting emails to more invitations to teach and get paid yeah yeah i'm getting more calls yeah so this is this is just the beginning this is just the beginning and what a place to do it in talavera de la reina <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of this place I'm ever. Among all places in the world. Yeah, yes. but I'm going to put a link in the description. We People should look into this. And I'm sure there's other yes. towns in Spain and other parts oh. of southern Europe. Entrepreneurs would thrive here. Very, yeah. Spend very little, have a great lifestyle, and be, be able to focus in their businesses and things like that. You know, what, what if, like when I look at it, I mean, you think about it, $400 a month for the mortgage. So if you wanted to finance the next decade... To be able to focus on your craft, that would be four hundred dollars times twelve months a year. So that's five thousand dollars a year. So under fifty k, forty eight thousand dollars, which to some people might be a lot, some people might be a little bit. But forty eight thousand dollars that finances your living space, and it's a big living space. You could probably Airbnb some of the rooms if you yes, wanted to. Yes. Right. Forty eight thousand dollars for a decade of living cost in terms of your place to sleep and work. Yes. Right. And. That's incredible. I think that's, you know, sometimes those lifestyle changes and maybe it means moving to a different location, lower cost living. Yes. In this world we live in now where cities have become so expensive compared to the average incomes, right? Yes, that's um, for sure. But on the other hand, there's different ways that people can make an income now than what previous generations had. And so with that, there is... There are, there are uh, opportunities as well. There's challenges and there's opportunities. And that might involve going to a lesser known town or city in another country or in your country and still having a great setup because that's important. You want to be productive. You want to be healthy. You want to have space yep. to live and work. Yep. But being able to do that in a way where it's, I mean, the economics are totally different. The pressure on the short-term income it's totally different under this scenario compared to being in Madrid or London or New York. Oh, yes. I mean, more and more people are moving outside of Madrid. Madrid has become extremely expensive. Like people don't make, like people who live now in Madrid center tend to be foreigners or people who uh, elsewhere, from elsewhere because their regular salaries cannot pay for that. It's way too expensive. It's way too expensive. And it's too crowded now. Yeah. I like the, the mix of peacefulness here. Like very, very like, yeah. This is, I mean, hey, welcome to Talavera de la Reina. If you pass by, you can write to me. <laughs> I yeah. give you a tour. Yeah, yeah, we'll put your, we'll put your contact. Yeah, in the my, my channel and all of that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. your yeah. channel and everything. Yeah, yeah. All right, Carlos. Well, it's hey. been a pleasure to come out here and see you. So of thanks course. for having me. Same, man. Yeah. Same. Pleasure. And we'll be in touch. Bye, everybody. Take care. Take care.